language because of course is an exam but we uh, in the UN language is uh, preferably said like review and not exam mm -hmm. so it's a peer review uh, so it's a mechanism that uh, is quite important for the, the even the life of each of us so uh, I do hope that you yes is it the mechanism which uh, each committee uh, introduced by different uh, conventions? No, it's a different one. So it's a different one. So just to um, uh, just a second. I'm sorry, I'm not very really good with this laptop. But um, what you are mentioning are the treaty bodies. Mm -hmm. So we have 
This is the EU animal rights system, which is very complicated, a lot of mechanisms, a lot of bodies, a lot of procedures. You will have this slide in your materials. The one that you were referring to are the nine committees here. So the nine committees here that are committees of independent experts that are established by each of the nine or ten, it depends if we consider the, uh, the protocol on the, that established the subcommittee on torture, um, uh, uh, that, that established specific treaty uh, bodies, mm -hmm. so bodies based on the treaties, on the convention, on the nine fundamental conventions. Why uh, we, I was referring to the Human Rights Council here and specifically to this mechanism, the Universal Periodic Review, UPR. So, of course, these three devices are very important, but to cover all that would be not two hours, but probably two weeks. So, we we'll concentrate on the UPR. So this is a very simplified version of the uh, UN human rights system. It's not the one that you can find in the in the in the internet. It's, it's of course a simplified version, and uh, just to have clear which are the bodies and where are they collocated in the big machine. So uh, you will have this in your. So uh, just uh, in order to be uh, directly to the, to the Universal Periodic Review, okay, uh, so we will concentrate on, uh, on one of the mechanisms of the Human Rights Council. So I just want to have everyone the common background of the Human Rights Council. So the, four, the first four or five slides will be kind of a little snapshot on what is the Human Rights Council, what, uh, when it was it established and everything. So the Human Rights Council is a council, is a body that we normally define as charter-based bodies. Hmm? Charter, so based on the UN Charter, the 1945 Charter, but of course it was established in 2006. So how can this happen? No, is a charter-based body. So the charter was <laughs> adopted in 1945, and the Council was established in 2006. Um, this is possible because actually the Human Rights Council replaced the Human Rights Commission. So. In 1945, actually, the body that was established by the UN Charter was a uh, uh, Human Rights Commission, which was the commission that, what was the first act that the, the Human Rights Commission did? All of you know. All of you know what the Human Rights Commission did in 1948, after three years of negotiations. Yes, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, in 1945, the Human Rights Commission was established as one of the charter, the, the base of the charter. And for the first three years of uh, its life, uh, worked on the text of the Treaty Articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, the, the Human Rights Council replaced the Commission in 2006 and actually started to operate in 2007. So the question here is why did, which was the reasons why the Commission had to be replaced? So uh, why uh, did we need uh, any replacement? Was the Commission, the Human Rights Commission, um, proactive or uh, uh, effective in promoting and protecting the human rights? Probably not. Not completely, not so much. There was a lot of political discourse, a lot of topics that were completely taboo, a lot of uh, uh, incoherence 
if we can say, okay, so uh, states that were complaining that member states of the uh, Human Rights Commission were actually um, perpetrators or violators of human rights. So there was a lot of uh, political discourse and um, concerns going on at the Human Rights Commission and the Council replaced in 2006-2007. So um, actually, I remember this very well because I started working on human rights like 15 years ago. And uh, actually, we were advocating for having a very uh, skin body in a way. So a body that uh, wouldn't have like 53 member states, no? so a big elephant that would be difficult to manage and difficult to um, compel to, to, to achieve results. Um, so the hope was to have a body of like 30, 35 states, but that was impossible. So the uh, agreement, the compromise that uh, was reached was for 47 member states. So. The Human Rights Council is composed of 47 member states. How many members has the UN? Do you know how many are the member states of the UN? 193 today, South Sudan. So the South Sudan is now, now the, uh, the 93rd state. So, uh, of these member states, uh, 47 are elected by the General Assembly each May to become, for a three-year term, members of the Human Rights Council. So, normally they start at the beginning of the year to have a lot of uh, negotiation undergoing and a lot of uh, um, political pressure to candidate the state and support the candidature of the state before the, the General Assembly in order to have uh, the state elected in, uh, as member of the Human Rights Council. Actually, my country, Italy, uh, was elected as member of the uh, Human Rights Council in 2007 for a first three-year term that ended in uh, in, uh, in 2010, and then was re-elected for a second term in 2011. Mm -hmm. Normally a state has to present a so-called voluntary pledge, so an official important commitment that normally the Ministry of Foreign Affairs pronounced before the plenary of the General Assembly in order to, to candidate the state. So normally there is a voluntary pledge. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 this is a new <coughs> important thing. You know, it was a difference uh, between this Human Rights Council and the previous Human Rights Commission. So at least, at least, of course it's not legally binding, it's a voluntary pledge. But at least we have something in our hand, which is transparent, public, put in the five official UN languages, in the official website, saying that this country uh, candidating itself for the Human Rights Council has uh, undertaken the, the voluntary pledge to, for example, in the case of my country, to consider the ratification of the optional protocol of the Convention on, um, Against Torture, of considering uh, to improve the situation in the detention center, to uh, establish a human rights independent uh, authority, a human rights independent institution, and all these beautiful things that, of course, hasn't <laughs> done so far but at least they are there in the website. And yesterday we had a press conference launching this, um, this is the NGO side, so 
we launch uh, this um, uh, this uh, uh, monitoring report on the uh, 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 two years after the uh, recommendation that the Italy received from the Human Rights Council in the context of the EPR. Yesterday in Rome, as a network of uh, 86 NGOs, and uh, like the uh, uh, most important place for the Italian press, Federazione Nazionale della Stampa Italiana, we uh, launched in a press conference this uh, very uh, uh, cheap <laughs> main port, but monitoring uh, the 92. Uh, recommendation that Italy received in 2010 by the UPR and saying, okay, these were the recommendations where we are now, no? and asking for uh, our government to uh, produce and publish a uh, military report, like many countries uh, have already done, okay? So a military report. So at least the volunteer pledges are there. So you can uh, monitor them and uh, advocate for the implementation. So just for you to have uh, some more uh, inputs on the Human Rights Council, we have uh, 47 seats, uh, the term is three years, and uh, they are, of course, distributed in a geographical, sensitive uh, uh, scenario. So we have 13 places for Africa, 8 for Latin America and Caribbean, 13 for Asia, 6 for Eastern Europe, and 7 for Western Europe, North America, and Oceania. Uh, these are the member states of today. So these are the member states of today. Uh, what I want to, uh, to highlight here is that uh, differently from the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Council has already used last year with Libya the uh, power that it has to suspend one of the member states in the case of gross violation of human rights. So at least we have the proof of an attempt of better commitment mm -hmm. uh, compared to the Human Rights Commission. So uh, the General Assembly can suspend the rights and privileges of uh, any council member uh, in case of gross violation of human rights, uh, and of course, uh, a two third majority is needed in the General Assembly. So, there is a resolution of the Human Rights Council suggesting to the General Assembly to suspend a state in case of gross violation of human rights. Any questions so far? No. What about you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Human Rights Council has a lot of mechanisms, okay, so very difficult, a lot of procedures, the lawyers can be very active before the Human Rights Council. Uh, the special procedures are very important, the individual complaints are very important, there are many, many, the complaint procedure is of course very important, there are many of them. <laughs> The social forum is very important for NGOs. This year will be in, uh, from uh, 1st to 3rd October in Geneva. So these are uh, all very important, but we won't consider them today. So we will go uh, for the uh, we will go for the um, for the UPR. In the PowerPoint, you have at least some uh, inputs about the special procedures. Which is important, but we will concentrate on, on the universal periodic review. It's a new mechanism, so I want to concentrate on the UPR for many different reasons. So one, because it's universal. So uh, my uh, idea when uh, Uli and Tiene asked me to, to share or 
bit of the, the practical experience with you was to have a classic animal from all over the world and to have something that is really universal mm -hmm. for any country in the world, the uh, US, uh, China, Italy, <coughs> Bahrain, uh, So this is the first thing. The other thing is that it's quite new and just few people, too few people, and we know about the UPR and how to use the mechanism and how to deal with it. Um, so let me go on a bit more about the explanation and how does the procedures work, and then we will try to have some more participatory uh, time <laughs> on, uh, on uh, several uh, questions and topics that could come to your mind. Um, so, um, the, the Universal Periodic Review has a specific objective, and you can find it here, okay? In the resolutions that establish the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, you can read this objective. So, um, it's a peer review. Universal Periodic Review is a peer review, so there is a, a state and review, and the other 46 states are considering the state, so are reviewing the state, are recommending the state, okay? So, uh, is a kind of peer review, is a mechanism that exists in the African Union, a mechanism that exists in the context of OECD, in the context of the EU. So there are many different mechanisms of peer review, and this is, of course, one of them in the context of the Universal Council. So uh, it's aimed to encourage states to fulfill their universal obligation and commitment. <laughs> of the UPR. The treaty bodies that you mentioned before actually deals only with the state that have ratified the convention. Where are you from? Yeah. Italy. Okay. So Italy, for example, has, hasn't ratified the, as Germany and as all the others, the convention on the rights uh, of migrant workers. So, of course, can't be considered by the committee on the, uh, on the rights of migrant workers because the committee only can consider the states that have ratified. Why the UPR is actually based on the consideration of any legal obligation under the human rights law. So, even voluntary pledge, okay? So, and this is important because, for example, the, among the, the 92 uh, recommendations that Italy received at the end of the UPR uh, process, like 60% were about migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and so on. And, uh, of course, this was a unique opportunity because uh, I mean, it was the only mechanism that could really scrutinize Italy. Can you understand my English, I hope? <laughs> uh, can really examine uh, the situation in Italy uh, in the fulfillment uh, of, uh, of the rights of migrants. No, because of course Italy has a pretty far. Um, so to enhance the state's capacity, so of course here is really underlying a lot the positive aspects, you know, so that is of course a positive approach, not naming and shaming, but is a review in order to promote mm -hmm. a positive approach. And uh, to provide technical assistance because of course even a fund was established in the, in the UN fund in order to support a state that asks for assistance, technical assistance, legal assistance, in order to uh, prepare the, the review and then follow up the recommendations received. Uh, okay. Then, uh, 
So, which are the principles of the UPR? Probably the simulation of so universality, periodicity is a peer review, participation of stakeholders, and is aimed to complement and not duplicate other mechanisms. So these are all features that are very important. So universality, because it's all 103, sorry, uh, uh, UN member states. Uh, so, and so far, the first cycle, the first cycle under the 192, because of course uh, South West Sudan wasn't considered in the first cycle, but in the first cycle there was no state that uh, pronounced or wasn't available to go under the scrutiny of the UPR. So even North Korea, even a state like Bhutan or Korea, states that have ratified very few conventions that normally under the treaty values or the special procedures are not so keen to invite independent experts or so on, but they were keen in participating in the UPR, in the periodic uh, review. So this was great because uh, you could see uh, the uh, president of Iran with all the delegation of Iran for three years and a half sit there answering to all the questions and uh, listening to all the recommendations. So, uh, and this, this was very important because it was Italy, it was Denmark, it was Germany, it was, I mean, uh, any country can have uh, can improve the performance in terms of human rights promotion and protection. So this was very important. US also, US have ratified very few conventions. So having the US sitting in the UPR was very important because US in terms of human rights have ratified just few international conventions. So the universality is of course um, an important feature. The other feature is that uh, all human rights are considered under the UPR, so not only civil and political rights, like in the European Court for Human Rights or in the uh, San Jose, the, 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 the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, but all human rights, civil, cultural, economic, political, social rights, and any kind of uh, uh, of obligation, okay? So even the voluntary places. The periodicity was every four years. Um, in the in in the last session of the Human Rights Council in May, there was a proposal to extend this time frame to four years and a half, and in order to have not 48 states considered each year, but in order to have less state considered each year. And uh, I know that probably this has passed. Um, it's an intergovernmental mechanism. So for example, I perfectly remember in 2005, 2006, uh, we NGOs very active in the context of the of the reform of the uh, UN human rights system were very critical on a mechanism that would have been completely governmental and intergovernmental. So we were very afraid that everything on about the human rights was would have been very state driven. Uh, this is of course the reality. But uh, now some years have passed, uh, I'm uh, all elder, <laughs> and I can uh, be more positive on uh, the mechanism and even on, on, the, on the fact that there is an intergovernmental body. So probably the uh, same intrinsic feature of being intergovernmental has allowed for this universality and universal um, consideration of uh, any country of the world. It's a peer review where very, was very criticized that in Spanish was translated officially as uh, examen periodico universal. So, um, so there were many complaints about that it's not an exam, 
examination and exam, but is a PPU. So they are PPU, they are all government, all the among the peers. <laughs> and the participation of the stakeholders, including uh, NGOs, is also another important uh, feature that we will consider. So what is the basis of the EPR? We said not only the convention and treaties that the country has ratified, but the charter, the declaration, um, the, the convention and treaties that the country has ratified, but even other international obligations, the voluntary pledges and commitments, and of course all applicable international and humanitarian law. So probably this was one of the first mechanisms where humanitarian law was considered in, in the human rights uh, body uh, because they were kind of parallel for so many decades. So what is the documentation that is considered in the review? Uh, if you, we will afterwards, we will open the, the website where you can find the information for your own country. And you will find these three uh, important reports. The national report, the UN communication, and the summary of the other stakeholders. So a very important document because it's very synthetic. So in 30 pages, you have a very exhaustive and complete snapshot of what is the situation in a specific country from the government point of view, from the civil society point of view, from, uh, from the independent expert point of view. Since the national report is prepared by the government. So it's a governmental report where the government explains what is the situation under the human rights legal obligation in uh, its own country. And this could be maximum 20 pages. This is a great thing. Because under the treaty bodies, for example, normally the national reports are 300 pages or 400 pages length, and nobody reads them. Mm -hmm. And then they, there are a lot of uh, inconsistencies and incoherencies and so on. So to have a uh, deviation for the state to prepare a national report, just the 20 pages, very straight to the point and straight to the point and straightforward, and it's a great improvement. Then we have the compilation. So the compilation is prepared by the people like you, uh, like you that have uh, uh, finished their master studies and are uh, interns in the uh, Office of International Human Rights that uh, um, make a compilation. So it's not just a collage, but it's uh, a compilation of all the recommendations received by the state from treaty bodies, special procedures, independent experts, special rapporteur, and others that have visited the countries or considered the country under the, the treaty body uh, monitoring uh, cycle. Then we have a summary, which is normally a, a, a summary of the, 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 the information received by other stakeholders, like NGOs and national human rights institutions. So this is very important because it is it was is something new. So um, four years ago, you wouldn't have find in 30 pages the official voice of the government, the official voice of the independent expert, so treaty bodies, especially the cities and others, and the, the voice of NGOs put there in the official website and considered. So this is very important. <laughs> uh, it is quite interesting to, I think, for you to have a look of 
what your country said and what the uh, compilation said and what the summary said. Uh, I will show you in, uh, in the case of Timor Leste, which was one of the last countries to consider in the March. In, um, in the third cycle, in order to have uh, a bit of the idea of how does the procedure work, it's actually quite complicated. But you know that only if you get into the co procedures, you can really find the holes that allow for a, an active, free, and meaningful participation from lawyers and civil society in general. So. Uh, Normally, uh, I can show you like this. We have the, um, the UPR working group here, which is a session in Geneva of the Human Rights Council. And then we have a plenary here. So we have two sessions of the Human Rights Council when the uh, country, um, the state, and the is considered in the context of the UPR. So the working group session, so the UPR working group, is actually the same thing of the plenary. No difference. Just the Human Rights Council sits in a different form. So we have the same 47 member states that are part of the plenary, the Human Rights Council, and the uh, same 47 member states that are part of the UPR working group. So, do you remember the, the first slide? You have the, uh, the, the big O of the Human Rights Council with the, the model scene from the Spanish artist. So, you have the 47 member states, the 47 delegation that are um, presenting the 47 member states of the Human Rights Council sitting in front. And then in the back, you have all the others that are observers, but are not members of the Human Rights Council, they are observers. But actually, um, as far as my experience, uh, considering a kind of 10, 12 countries have been really present in the whole uh, observing the EPR for at least uh, 20 countries and considering uh, all the, the, the assessment and evaluation that you can read in uh, many NGOs and the many experts uh, on the EPR uh, by the end of the third cycle, you will see that there is not real difference between the Human Rights Council member states and themselves. Because so many times there are so many states on the list of speakers that the president of the Human Rights Council decides. Because in theory, the uh, Human Rights Council member states have three minutes time to speak, while the others have just two minutes. Okay? But in, in, in real life, in the majority of the time, the president of the Human Rights Council decides to put two minutes for everybody because there are two uh, speakers in the list of speakers. So for time constraints, all are treated in the same way. So the important thing is that uh, like uh, one year before the plenary, before the consideration by the Human Rights Council, you have the, the deadline for the submission of other stakeholders. So if you are an NGO, if you are uh, an university, if you are a group of people, I mean, you are not required and you don't have any requirement. You don't have to have ECOSOC uh, consultative status. You don't have to fill any specific format, okay? You can just submit information before the deadline, one year before the consideration. And of course, you have <laughs> guidelines in order to submit. So you have a format to submit. Okay? You, have, you have to follow some specific guidelines in order to submit 
your information to the Human Rights Council concerning Italy or whatever country you want, but you don't have to, ha to have any requirement. Okay? This is a, a, a very a large uh, enabling participation of anyone. Then, uh, like uh, kind of uh, 13 weeks before the session, the national uh, report <coughs> is published in the website. Mm -hmm. It's published in the Office of the Commission for Human Rights website. And um, together with the submission of information, so the summary and the compilation. Then, uh, at the end, working group session, the UPR working group, that is the adoption of the kind of report on the country, which uh, is then adopted by the plenary of the Human Rights Council normally two or three months after. So this is kind of one year procedures that has two consideration to face-to-face -face session. One as UPR working group and the other as plenary of the Human Rights Council. So, um, I don't want to go in the Troikas because the, the role of the Troikas is, can be, uh, it is very specific and can be uh, Normally there is a lot of political pressure because uh, the Troikas are normally the one that will uh, draft the final report. So are three states, members of the Human Rights Council, that for the state under review will draft the final report. Actually, they do not have any real active role because normally the draft is made by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights considering together with uh, also the state and the union some of the recommended state. <coughs> so on the role of the Troika then if you are interested, okay, but mm -hmm. I, I want to go with mm -hmm. So the important thing is that the government uh, of the state and the review has presented a national report um, and then uh, have to uh, explain uh, present this national report in the UPR session. So we said that the UPR uh, working group session is normally three hours. So if a state is very serious and really want to have an interactive dialogue and a review, won't take up to one hour or up to 40 minutes in order to present something that is already published 10 weeks uh, before the session. Okay? In the case of my country, mm, uh, the minister took like uh, 35 minutes to present again the 20 pages of the national report of Italy. Mm? But I see, for example, Denmark and Norway that have taken like 10 minutes and then have allocated all the time remaining for more time for the dialogue. Okay? Because the interactive dialogue, how the exam, how the review is called in the demand language, uh, is the most important part. So it's where uh, the, the questions are raised, where the recommendations are made. So it is quite important. Of course, it's normally up to two hours, but can be more if the presentation of the state and review takes less. And then, of course, it's given the floor again to the state and review for some uh, concluding remarks, which in the diplomatic uh, language are the answers to the questions that were raised. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's not a judicial hearing. You are lawyers, you don't have the state and review as in a judicial means. It's not. We can say it is a judicial review. But in practice, almost. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you, can, you have all the delegation 
of the state and the union sit in front of the 47 member states and all the other member states that is there sit answering questions and trying to comment on the recommendations that were raised. Okay? The weekend part of the story is that, of course, the outcome is not legally binding because our recommendation, so in the in juridical terms, is not, um, they are not legally binding. So the outcome report um, is not, uh, of course, legally binding. Um, then in the session of the plenary, which is three or four months after the UPR working group session, we have um, the states under, we have one hour allocated to the same state. And in this hour, which is like 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and 20 minutes, we have the state uh, under review that has to pronounce which one of the recommendations received in the previous session does accept or does reject, because a country can also reject the recommendation that we see. In the case of Italy, Italy received 92 recommendations and actually rejected 12. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the recommendations was um, we recommend Italy to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Migrant Workers and Members of the Families. And Italy said, uh, uh, as a matter of urgency, within uh, this year uh, and so on. And Italy answered, we uh, reject this recommendation because the uh, issue of migration is not um, domestic law, but is part of the, the <coughs> items that goes uh, under the agenda of the EU. So we do not have national sovereignty on the <laughs> migration law, which was the government. <laughs> we do not have um, sovereignty on the migration law, because we are we have to follow what the EU, no, you can read, everything is fine. Uh, you, we have to follow what the EU tells us, so something like that. So the, the, the state under you has to, to, say, to say, I accept, I reject. And if I reject, why do I reject? So this is very important because you can find documents in five languages. They are published and, uh, and, uh, and uploaded in the website. So it is quite important. Um, so 20 minutes are for the position and recommendations of replies and so on if the country accepts or doesn't. 20 minutes are from other member or, or service states. And then the final 20 minutes are allocated to other stakeholders that can make a general comment. So, of course, this, uh, this is quite weak because at the end of all the process, other stakeholders are, for example, NGOs, can take the floor for two minutes, but the process I mean, is already at the end, it's already finishing. No? So, how can they influence the result of the process if they can take the floor only at the end of the process? But this was almost the same in Rio Plus So all our question and, the, and the statement with the bureau that were, was leading the negotiation in the Rio Plus 20 were from 8 to 9 in the evening. <laughs> no one was considering us, but at least you can find it there. In the in the in the in the conflation of the uh, of all the, 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 the proceedings. So the general comments. I mean, general comments can be general recommendation or I mean, not on individual cases. Mm -hmm. General in the sense, not individual cases, but uh, if you, for example, watch uh, my the, 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 my submission. Um, in 
in the consideration of Italy, it was very much on the need for Italy uh, of uh, you know, rights independent institutions in line with the Paris principles and why does Italy need it, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, human rights institutions and, and so on. For two minutes, it's very beneficial. <laughs> and, and then the Human Rights Council votes and actually endorse the outcome report that was presented by the uh, UPR. So, I, for me, it would be important to say a bit more on the NGO participation and uh, on the follow-up, but before that, I want to show you the, why you often raise some questions or comments. I want to show you the website where you can find uh, your own uh, country, or in my case, the one country. Any questions so far? Yes. Yes. What, like, what do you think are the best ways for an interest group to get successful outcomes out of this process? I know it's only started in 2006, but are there any examples that have already led to something? Or is it hard to judge? Um. If you go to one of the website or the NGO website they, that I suggest in the materials, the uprinfo.org, uh, they uh, have a marvelous database of good <coughs> practices and uh, of, uh, of um, kind of assessment of uh, how did the first cycle uh, work out. And um, actually, we have uh, several good examples of countries that have taken very seriously the UPR process. So, Italy, uh, in the opposite, has not even translated into Italian, officially translated into Italian, the 92 recommendations. Of course, there, there are many. Uh, an official translation that are circulated. One is from the, the, our network of the Comitato, no? But, I mean, the first legal obligation that should be fulfilled by a state in order to disseminate, you know, the result and the, 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 the process should be translating into the national language or even the local language. The case of Italy is very necessary because our English is very poor. So, um, I mean, in two years, the government hasn't translated, hasn't published, hasn't done almost anything, hasn't taken very seriously the process. But you have said that have uh, convened a press conference that have translated into the national language, into the local language, that have established specific monitoring bodies within the ministries, no? in order to, to monitor and follow up and implement the, the recommendations received. So you have good practices. Uh, there are good practices. Any other? This concept is useful about the, taking account that there are a lot of money involved in the system. Taking into account that there are a lot of monitoring? A lot of money in this system. Uh, a lot of what? Money. money. Uh, I don't know because um, money you consider the I mean, the, the, the representative that uh, actually stay uh, in the Human Rights Council are almost, uh, uh, I mean, ambassadors or uh, delegates that live uh, in Geneva, no? 
from uh, Bangladesh, from uh, the uh, Bangladesh ambassador to the UN in Geneva. So um, I don't know if it is uh, so expensive. I don't know if there are any um, any assessment or evaluation about how much how much was the cost of all these. But uh, I would say that is uh, I mean compared to many other mechanisms uh, quite cost uh, effective probably. Uh, of course the participation of NGOs is much more difficult because normally the NGOs that are able to take part in the process in Geneva are like the big ones, no? Say the children, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and all the usual ones that have already um, headquarters or uh, branches in Geneva, while the local NGOs are participating very Linked to this, no? So, so I just want to go here to the, if I can, here Universal Periodic Review, the very bottom of the Office of Life Commission for Human Rights, and then um, you have uh, uh, the opportunity to search by country. by the states that are listed. And then you have all webcasted. So this is a very important thing also because uh, I mean in, in these two hours I, I thought we wouldn't have the time to, to watch the video. But in, in the webcast archives you find the three hours of the concentration of the state and review by the, the UPI working group find a one hour plenary. So uh, it's great because you can really show the civil society in the university in the I use this in the University of Vienna you know, in the in the uh, in two thousand and ten this 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 uh, this webcast I mean this is simply marvelous. It's something that even three years ago we once we wouldn't have had. 
now the opportunity to have everything broadcast. So the opportunity to, to really participate, to really be uh, informed, no? so to have information, first-hand information on uh, what is going on in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the, within the doors of the Human Rights Council. So, I mean, if you uh, see this as an opportunity, it's great. I mean, but you have really the opportunity as a citizen, as a, uh, as a person, to watch uh, uh, what your government has really uh, declared before the Human Rights Council, considering the, uh, considering the situation on, uh, on, uh, of human rights promotion and protection in the country. That's great. And you can find, of course, also what NGOs have said, what uh, independent experts so for, for all the, 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 the three plus one hours you have the webcast that are cheap. So, uh, this would be uh, quite interesting. Any questions so far? So I hope that after the uh, football match tonight you will have a look <laughs> of the of the <laughs> of documents of your country. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I would like now to go if you don't have any other comment or question on the NGO participation, what are the NGOs? So don't you have any question? <laughs> Because um, I said before that actually you don't have any constraint, any requirement in order to submit information. So any Italian lawyer, any uh, Italian university can submit information. Hmm? But uh, then in order to participate in the uh, they are working with them in the plenary of the Human Rights Council, you need to be um, in ECOSOC status. So the written information can be sent by anyone, but the physical participation, the physical presence in Geneva is allowed only for the NGOs that have ECOSOC consultative status. Doesn't this kind of limit a lot of perhaps participation, especially maybe in countries where there's not as big a budget for NGOs? Um, you can have small community groups doing a lot on the ground, but might not be yeah. able to access it. But everything uh, in terms of NGO participation in the UN rights system is uh, in a way conditioned conditionated by the, the, the accreditation system or by the uh, recognition in, the, in a way by the Consultation before the uh, during the elaboration of the national report, then they can send submission of information to the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in like one year before the consideration. In one of the slides that you will have in the material, you will have one sheet calendar 2012 uh, 2016. Uh, where you can find all the 193 countries of the world where they are allocated. So Italy will be considered in 2014, where are you from? 
Australia, you can let, Australia was uh, probably this year, 2005. You have, you can check to make, you can check whenever your country will be considering the frame 2012, 2016. And uh, um, of course, the, the NGO can lobby the members of the working group, which are the same members, as we already said, of the Human Rights Council. So, can lobby for the seven members. So, uh, of course, we didn't know which are the states that were sensitive or that were keen to uh, recommend on national human rights institutions. So, uh, of course, it could be Switzerland, for example, that doesn't have a national human rights institution, but could have been. Uh, that has a good one that has uh, achieved the status R in terms of national human rights institutions. So, um, I mean, so the, the lobby can be lobbying just going to Geneva and trying to contact the, the embassies and so on, but we need to have the opportunity to uh, be there and participate in uh, the UPR working group, then we can have an idea of which are the um, the, 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 the most common recommendation that the state made as recommending state. So, the state under review and the recommending state. So, Italy as a recommending state, for example, normally uh, recommend about promotion of children's rights, a lot about um, protection of uh, children uh, involvement in, 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 in conflict. So this is uh, very much. Um, Italy as recommended states normally recommend a lot about the penalty. Um, so all things of course are uh, not a problem in Italy. Uh, while uh, uh, Italy as a state under review received a lot of recommendation about national human institution migrants and so on. So there is a double role now of each state as recommended state and as state under review. So if the NGOs have ECOSOC status, of course, can take the floor during the plenary of the Human Rights Council before the adoption of the outcome document. Uh, and of course, the NGO can monitor the implementation, like this is an example, uh, of the recommendation by the state and the so there are a lot, already a lot of best practices around the follow-up. And you can see that, uh, uh, for example, Argentina, Bahrain, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Finland, France, Japan, Mauritius, and Netherlands, Romania, Korea, UK, may meet their report. This is very important. So uh, they uh, wouldn't have Stay there in the standby for four years, no? From one uh, nuclear cycle to the other, but it has published a military report saying, okay, we see those recommendations, we have done that in order to implement the recommendation we see and so on. So this is uh, I want to just uh, show you something more about the uh, uh, episode. So, um, in order to answer to your... Um, so, up today there are like 3,180, so in the day, in June 2012, we have like 3,180 NGOs with conservative status in the National Council. In 1946, they were 41, and in 1990, which is a key date, because of course was the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and of course the 
the first uh, the, the, the era of enthusiasm uh, for a democratic promotion of action and multilateralism and all the things that you very well know, but uh, they were like 700. So they have been uh, growing and growing and growing in number. And uh, uh, the, the participation of NGOs in the UN bodies is uh, regulated by the, uh, Article 71 of the UN Charter. And uh, of course, we have different uh, system of limitations. Uh, so, for example, this Commission on Sustainable Development Groups, was, which was one of the commissions that were established by the uh, Rio Summit in 1992, Sustainable Development, um, it was established this commission with like uh, nine major group of civil society uh, and able to participate in the work of this commission. And among these nine major groups that were uh, children and youth, um, trade unions, uh, scientific community, Addis, there was an, an, an NGO major group. So one of the nine was the NGO group, and in this um, NGO group there are like 500 NGOs currently in the, the, the Commission of Sustainable Development. Um, so there are different requirements and procedures, but about the ECOSOC, ECOSOC remains the only uh, UN body which has a formal framework for an NGO participation. So in the case of the Human Rights Council, the Human Rights Council makes a specific reference to ECOS. So they uh, are allowed to take the floor and uh, speak in the plenary with the NGOs that have any uh, status, any consultative relationship uh, under Resolution 31 of the 1996, which is the resolutions that really deals with the implementation. So um, there are three different kinds of status for episode, but I don't want to go too much in detail. There are general status, uh, consultative, uh, special consultative status, and the positive status. The majority of NGOs have a special consultative status. Actually, the NGO I represent, which is PISA, Monotogata International Group of International Volunteers for Development, which is a, a big NGO uh, based in Rome, development NGOs that works in like 41 countries um, in the world. Uh, we have a special consultative status since 2009. It took us like three years of going through all the procedures in order to obtain this status. And actually, uh, I uh, read some days ago about the section of the NGO Committee of Microsoft that only like 20% the NGOs that apply for uh, Microsoft status in the session uh, were accepted and 80% were rejected. So 2009 was a bit better, I would say. So <laughs> I uh, don't know if you have uh, that I um, would like to propose to you, but uh, I think it would take longer, and I know that it's 70, 725, 730, and I know that in the, uh, 20 minutes we have to leave because we have guidance that have to go to <laughs> Germans, of course. <laughs> Yeah. So probably, I mean, um, the, the 
exercise that I had in mind to propose you was to divide you in different roles and to do like a role play about uh, some of you playing the role of uh, uh, state and you and some others of you playing the role of recommended state, some of you playing the role of NGOs, some of you playing the role of independent expert using the three documents, so the 20, uh, 20 pages of the national uh, before the 10 pages and um, 5 pages of the compilation and summary but you can do it in, uh, in another session if you want to uh, just read the documents. Yes. And actually two questions. Um, first would be um, how do this uh, um, review interact with the uh, different reports of the And the second question would be catching up you on your critique that you had beforehand on this system uh, before it was established and uh, your now more positive reaction. But I however, would uh, like to know a bit more because uh, after the consultation of Italy, for example, you have seen a bit much more how the impact of such a view theory uh, would have on a state like Italy. But is there really anything that you can see? Is there any sense that, and, and then judging the system as such would be interesting for you too? Two beautiful questions. So, the first one, uh, we said, we declare, uh, we can read that, of course, this mechanism of the UTR does not duplicate other mechanisms, specifically the three bodies. Uh, reporting system and the special procedures, but actually we have three uh, kinds of bodies, so the Human Rights Council, the treaty bodies and the special procedures that actually do the same. So do periodically monitor the implementation of legal obligation undertaken by the state. So how do they act? interact in practice. So uh, the first uh, <coughs> common uh, uh, ground would be that the basis for the consideration for the UPR are the, is the three documents, so the national report, this compilation. The compilation is actually a summary of the recommendation received by treaty bodies, special procedures, and other independent experts. So, if you uh, look, no? for example, in the case of uh, Italy, in the UPR of Italy, if you look uh, at the uh, compilation, we will use English and not Chinese or Arabic. <laughs> So if you go to the document concerning Italy, which is called Combination, it's a beautiful document that in five to ten pages, if I can open it, actually put on the floor that the country made and if they did recognize the competencies of the treaty bodies. Now the first is uh, said, the content of national fraction discrimination. Of course, it is accepted the Article 14 and 14 for the complaints. But then there was never an Italian lawyer using this Article 14. So, Please, if you are interested in Russian discrimination, if you are an Italian lawyer, try to study how does Article 14 works and try to use it because uh, it's really a shame that uh, it appears that in Italy we do not have any kind of problem concerning racism uh, 
in our country. So you have uh, this part, then you have uh, practically um, uh, a compilation of what the, the, the different treaty bodies, I don't know if you can see um, the, the, the quote, you know, from the treaty bodies and from the special procedures of, in this case, the special rapporteur was in the end, the special rapporteur on the uh, forms of racism and Russian discrimination in xenophobia. And the, 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 uh, the special rapporteur on the human rights of migrants that encouraged people to consider ratifying and uh, they, 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 they also recommended the ratification of all cuts. So we are in this. Um, in the low in the in the lows now in the books in the in the, in the convention not yet in low in the action because ratification is only the the very first um, uh, step. But then you have the constitutional and legislative framework and the institutional and human rights infrastructure, where, for example, was uh, considered establishing the national human rights institution and then the policy measures that were considered by the treaty bodies. So you have the information at least. Then you don't have an active role of the treaty bodies and special procedure during the UPR. <coughs> but at least you have their, their recommendation taken into account, compulsory. The second question was about, uh, was also very useful and was about uh, what is the complete practical impact of these recommendations in the country. Of course, it depends on the political region <laughs> of the country. I mean, um, the, the, I'm more positive because I see the role that civil society, that NGOs, that individual citizen can play. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, having first-hand information, uh, having opportunity to um, to monitor, having opportunity to advocate, no, not because. Uh, Carla Carazzone says that there is a need of national human rights, but because of the bodies of social procedures and the UPR said that. So I'm more positive because uh, I'm really uh, astonished by this important thing of having access to information, uh, direct access to information. But of course, then the political way, uh, no. They are not legally binding. So the recommendation of the UPR in this probably the weak part of all human rights law. That at the end of the story, we don't have a court, we don't have a tribunal. So the justiciability of human rights is really the 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 the, the issue, no? So that you have to use not legal binding or instruments, but so yes. I was just curious about the attitude of states uh, when the election uh, take place in general. I mean, um, how do they look at it? Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> Are they willing to to be elected, or um, do they try to hide? <laughs> they want to be elected, my man. Because they like to really judge other. <laughs> not that they are watching, but um, uh, positive watching. No, so ah, Italy has become member of the Human Rights Council. So it's mm -hmm. something that just really sounds like. Uh, great and important, so it's like uh, if a state is elected as a member state of the Human Rights Council, it's a kind of a proof that the state is performing well in terms of human rights. It's not true. <laughs> so um, uh, they want to be elected. They want to be elected. They struggle to be elected. 
the uh, fight with each other. So the, if you look at the voluntary pledges, they are always so positive, so um, in the declaration, in the, in the statement that uh, they made before the general assembly is quite uh, great. They want to be aware. Or question or anything? So, are you considering um, some of the other mechanisms of the Human Rights Council that you do not really know the deliverability? No. No. But we are considering to maybe um, to set our report on the detention center somehow.